Welcome to today's event on the mental health of Asian American youth and young adults. My name is Michelle Hawks, and I'm the director of the Liu Institute for Asian and Asian Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. The Liu Institute was established thanks to an extremely generous gift to the university by the Liu family, an Asian American family, two of whose children studied at Notre Dame. This year, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of that gift by highlighting and celebrating some of the work on Asian American issues that is done at this university. I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Wei Yang Xie. Dr. Xie obtained her master's degree and her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Minnesota. She joined Notre Dame as a staff psychologist in 2015. She recently achieved tremendous success by being awarded a large grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for a three-year project aimed at improving mental health in Asian immigrant families. In today's talk, she will tell us more about the project and her work among the Asian American community. Dr. Shear will speak for about 45 minutes, followed by Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box at any point during our session. The Q&A will not be recorded. The event will conclude promptly at noon. Dr. Xie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure, my honor to be here today and to have this conversation with everyone. Um, so I want to introduce myself a little bit uh, on a personal level. Uh, uh, I uh, grew up in China and uh, I'm also a first generation immigrant. I came to the US um, for my uh, graduate school. And um, after I graduated from University of Minnesota, as Michelle mentioned, uh, I landed at University of Notre Dame and for my work as a clinical psychologist. So um, the topic I'm presenting today is very, uh, it's a personal topic to a lot of us Asian American immigrants. And um, so I have a PowerPoint slide uh, I would like to share with everyone as I'm talking. So uh, can folks see my slide? If you can, uh, maybe Michelle, you can give me a thumb up because I can only see your face here. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> All right. So my topic today is uh, a community-based effort in promoting Asian American youth and young adults' mental health. Uh, mental health is a heavy topic. Um, and we will start our conversation, our presentation today with a group of the data that reflect uh, the gravity, reflect the gravity of this topic as well. Um, so uh, let's see the first slide. Why talk about mental health? So mental disorder top the list of the most costly conditions in the United States. It's about 200 billion, it's more than that. And also mental health issues are on the rise, especially among millennials and Gen Zers. So what Gen Zers mean is that it's Generation Z, and this refers to a group of people, young adults who are born after mid 1990s. So if you think about that, and that puts them into an age group of uh, 20, uh, if they're born in 1995, they will be 25, 26 this year, right? So uh, anyone who are younger than that group are the Gen Zers. So that include our uh, children, adolescents, young adults, our college students, and some of our graduate students, right? And why it's becoming uh, an issue, a more and more serious issue among millennials and Gen Zers. There are a lot of uh, sayings about that, a lot of hypotheses about that, right? Could be loneliness. This generation feel very lonely regardless of the, um, the social media connections we're able to have, right? And the burnout, the stress from their career, from their job, from their academic work. And also racial stress, discriminations, a lot of those folks, uh, students are facing as a minority group in living in the society. And this past year, COVID, right, COVID has posed a really unique challenge 
on a lot of people's mental health, the isolation and the adjustment, forced adjustment, a lot of those things and have contributed to the rising of the mental health problems. And when I say mental health problems or mental health issues, it refers to almost all kinds of mental health issues across the board. That could be depression, anxiety, stress, suicide rates, and also um, substance use. They are all on the rise. So let's take a look at more closely and specific at our Asian American students and their mental health. So Asian American students have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and attempts than almost all other racial ethnic groups, but much lower rates of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. Asian American students have more internalizing symptoms, more peer victimization and lower self-esteem compared to their white peers. And we're gonna talk about some of the reasons behind this uh, later. And now we have another group of data here. Despite the high rate of mental health problems and suicidality in this population, Asian Americans are among the least likely of all racial groups to utilize mental health services and Asian American students who do receive treatment experience less improvement compared to their white students, white peers. I know uh, at the uh, registration uh, uh, questionnaires, some of the uh, participants audience ask a question about, do you know any data about specific Asian American groups, right? So I did get a chance to dig into some of the research and there's some research showing there are some differences among different ethnic groups. Um, so for example, Chinese, Filipino, Indian, Japanese, Korean and Vietnamese and we break them into those groups based on one research. They have found that Korean and Japanese American men showed higher rate, showed higher suicide rate than men of other Asian groups. And Korean and Japanese American women showed a higher suicide rates than Indian and Filipino American women. I have to mention here when they say Chinese and the research wasn't specific about if it's Chinese from mainland China or Chinese speaking in general. So um, we do have some data showing that, but majority of the research that about mental health among Asian Americans has focused Asian American as a holistic group. So I wanna pause here and I know some of those data can be really alarming and concerning. So I just wanna check with our audience to see what kind of thoughts and reaction you may have right now. And also have you heard or know anyone personally in your Asian American community who are suffering or suffered from mental health issues? And this is totally optional. You, do, you are not obligated to share, but if you do have any thoughts, feel free to type at the chat box. I will be monitoring. I give folks about two minutes to see. Someone asked, how does this compare to Asians that did not grow up in the US? I think the data are to some extent consistent, but also because different culture have different stressors and it could be different. Um, I do know that I come across all of the research I have read, the Japanese and also Korean uh, have a higher rate of suicide rate. A uh, higher suicide rate compared to other groups, compared to Chinese and compared to Filipino. So it's very similar. Yeah, so most of the research we have found are among Asian Americans. So international community, yes. So the data, some, uh, some of the data also include international students studying in the US. So physically being in the US. All right. All right, before we talk more about Asian Americans mental health, I do wanna start uh, briefly from uh, 
talking about mental health in general, and I want to talk about some of the common myths people having about mental health. The very first one is mental health is a sign of weakness or inadequacy. And I have encountered this a lot in my own practice. Students are hesitant to come to counseling when they are struggling with mental health issues because they are worried being stigmatized. They're being worried of being judged by others. Oftentimes, the judgment also comes from themselves. They internalize the message that my mental health problems is a sign of my inadequacy. And then we can see this for uh, among a lot of Asian uh, Americans and also Asian American men, especially. Oftentimes, we see uh, weakness as a negative indicator of uh, masculinity, right? And we're not encouraged to share our tears or crying, and oftentimes it being judged or considered as uh, emotional instability. And so having mental health tied to our identity or our characters as a person can be really dangerous because that stops people from reaching out for help when they need it. So what is mental health? If it's not a sign of weakness or inadequacy, what it is, I would like to talk about mental health from a model that you are looking at right now. So mental health actually, mental health problem is a development of combination of different factors, including biological and psychological and social environmental factors. So what this means is that any of us who have some vulnerabilities from any of those factors can be um, more susceptible to certain mental health issues at any point of our life, no matter of your socioeconomic status, your IQs. So for example, let's say biological factors, right? Children may inherit a genetic predisposition to have depression if there's a family history. So people with parents or siblings who have depression are up to three times more likely to have the same condition. And also there's age factor in that biological uh, category, right? And there are research showing that in your mid twenties and you're more likely to have depression compared to any other time of your life. So you're more likely, three times more likely to have depression when you are in uh, between age of 18 to 29 than when you are um, older than your 60s. Why is this the case for depression? And there are a lot of reasons. It could be hormone related. It could be um, cognitive restriction when you are younger, right? And you have less uh, cognitive uh, flexibility in terms of uh, related to uh, life in general. And also a lot of students are still learning how to uh, in regulate their emotions and build their tolerance for distress. So there are a lot of reasons, but I just want to mention this is a generalization. Not every student is like that, but because of this age factor, biological factor, they do put our students in a more vulnerable group. And there could be psychological reasons, right? And so a meta-analysis showed that patients with depression scored higher than non-clinical samples, people who are not depressed, on neuroticism and lower on, lower on extroversion and conscientiousness. What does this mean is that people who are who have the tendency to experience negative emotions and react strongly to stress tend to have more likelihood to have depression. And also people who are less outgoing and um, talkative and energetic, those people tend to have more likelihood to get depression. And also people who are less organized, less go-oriented and less um, uh, more impulsive are more likely to have depression. So those are psychological factors there. And the last one is social and the environmental factor, right? And so think about uh, abuse, neglect, and bullying and in a person experience in their childhood, and also grief and loss, a sudden loss of someone important, your caregiver. 
right? And also it can be uh, other social uh, triggers and uh, stressors. For example, COVID, right? This past year has been really hard for a lot of people. The social isolation, the racial stress, and adjustment to new living lifestyle. Uh, a lot of those can all contribute to the development of mental health problems. So let's look closely at our Asian American students, our Asian American population, why there's a higher rate of suicide and why there are more uh, mental health issues and less uh, um, promising uh, diagnosis, uh, prognosis and diagnosis and outcome. So let's see, there are a couple of things that our Asian American students are facing nowadays that are unique. The first one is the pressure to meet the expectation of high academic achievement and live up to the model minority stereotype. We probably know anecdotally, a lot of Asian Americans, including myself, can have a high level of perfectionism. And this perfectionism can be associated with our high personal standards, our parental expectation and criticism. And we do know clinically, professionalism increased the risk of psychological distress. And then the second one is challenges navigating between two different cultures. Young Asian, young Asian Americans, especially Asian American women, may feel conflicted between uh, wanting to satisfy strict expectations from their parents and from society and rebelling against the perfect Asian woman stereotype. This can lead to challenges with identity along with unhealthy coping skills, including self-harm and suicide thoughts and also difficult communicating with parents, family obligations based on strong family values, Asian culture emphasize interdependence and family cohesion. Sometimes there's low levels of family communication and this can increase the risk of mental health issues. This can increase suicide ideation more than three times. And also certain parenting styles characterized by being disempowering, authoritarian and burdensome may also be associated with increased mental health issues and suicide behaviors, especially among young Asian American women. And another one that we probably all have heard about is stigmatization and also different or low help seeking attitude and low delayed detection. And stigmatization, and similar to what I mentioned before, you know, how we see mental health issues. If we um, judge ourselves for experiencing them, and we may not be able to uh, feel comfortable talking, talk about our struggles with others, or seek for professional help. And also, traditionally, for Asian cultures, when we struggle with problems, we tend to look for uh, peers, family, friends, relatives to talk about those things. And looking for professional health is still relatively new concept for a lot of Asian Americans. And because of this, and a result in a low or delayed detection of mental health problems. That's why in clinical setting in my office, oftentimes when I see my students, Asian American students struggling with mental health issues, a lot of them may have had a more severe symptoms than their um, non-Asian peers because of some of those reasons. And then another one, I think is also something we have talked about a lot, especially this past year, discrimination and isolation within the dominant society due to racial and cultural backgrounds. And let's look at this. And I have some um, newspaper clip that I wanna show that uh, about the discriminations that Asian American, Asian American students have faced since COVID. I think we probably all have heard about this. I personally have students being treated differently um, on campus and in their um, neighborhood. And some of them can be in, um, unintentionally, some of them are very explicit and overt. 
And we all know racial stress is an indicator, another indicator of mental health problem, development of psychological mental and health problems. So um, this is some of the unique factors. So now putting all of them together, what does this mean? And I have another graph here for people and two glasses with water in them. And you can see the left glass, the water level is higher than the other glass next to it. So we talk about all of the biological, psychological, and also environmental factors, right? They can increase our predisposition to mental health problems. And so they are just like the waters in the glass. Some people have more predisposition, and so they have a higher water line. Some people have more resilience and less fact, uh, contributing factors, so they have a lower water line in the glass. And what does this mean is that when they encounter triggers in their life, the triggers can be college adjustment. For a lot of people coming to college, leaving their family support system behind is a huge adjustment. And if they encounter adjustment challenging or they have relationship breakup, they lose their primary support or simply just academic stress, accumulated academic stress. And those can become the triggers to cause the glass, the water to spill out of the glass. People have more predisposition will be more likely to have that glass, that water spill out then people have less predispositions. So those triggers can be like, if you have a hand, imagine your hand holding the glass and triggers can be the pressure coming from your hands. So a lot of students we see in our office in counseling, it's not that all of a sudden they show mental health problems, they develop those problems. It can be throughout their life up to they meet you at that point, they have been predisposed to a lot of those mental health issues because of the biological, psychological, and social environmental factors that we may um, take it serious, may have not taken it seriously. So that's one thing that I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the importance of prevention to prevent those things from happening. Um, let's see what else here. So I want to talk a little bit more about suicide here as well, because I know a lot of our audience ask this question at the registration um, a survey. And so suicide among Asian Americans. So this is a data that uh, we have the most updated one I can find, but I assume that in the past three years, it hasn't changed that much. Suicide was the second leading cause of death among all Americans aged 15 to 24 in the US. So how about our AA? Suicide was the number one cause of death among Asian Americans in the same year. Asian college students are 60% more likely than white students to seriously consider suicide. Those are really sad news. So there are a couple of common uh, causes to suicide. Um, for example, the most common one we know is depression. Depression, severe depression with a sense of hopelessness can be an indicator of suicide. And another thing can be bipolar disorder, some of the mood disorders and substance use, and also some of the personality disorder, more borderline personality disorder. Those can increase your impulsivity and people more likely to do things to hurt themselves. Um, I know some people also ask me a question about the impact of our news report about suicide and how that impacted the suicide rate. Um, I think we probably all have this anecdotal experience that whenever there's some news reporting about suicide and we can, experience, we can experience some reactions in our community, right? I have had students coming to me being triggered, uh, their own suicide thoughts become triggered. I have students and talking about some um, family members or friends they know who got triggered. So there's some connection there. So how to report suicide is a very important thing 
there's a there was a study showing uh, this is 90s 86. I don't have the graph here with me, but um, that year a Japanese uh, singer passed away, died of suicide, and the media back then somehow sensationalized it or idolized it. And in the following couple of months, you see a surge of suicides in the society. So what we usually recommend is that do not use suicide as your title. Try not to use um, um, commit suicide, so those derogatory terms, instead of died of suicide. Right? And we also talk about, uh, do not talk about specific means, how they do that, do not idolize it, do not sensationalize it. And most importantly, talk about what are the resources out there that can help people who are also struggling with similar issues. Those can be national suicide prevention hotline information or for a campus community that can be university counseling center, right? Your residential support staff, all of that. So um, that's just something that I wanna uh, add in response to um, some of, uh, in response to some of audience questions. Okay, let's see if I did it too fast. Go back here. And then there's another, let me make sure I have everything. Okay, all right. So there's another myth I wanna talk about is people who attempt suicide are selfish. I think more or less we have heard about this, right? And we have heard about, uh, heard about this comments. So is this true? And I think we all probably agree it is not. This is a common misconception. People who are suicidal often view themselves as a burden on others, which is a common symptom of depression. They are, not, they are not taking the easy way out, but instead mistakenly, they believe others would be better off, their family, their community would be better off without them, or suicide is the only way left out there to end their unbearable pain. So those are the things that um, we probably all have heard of, but I just want to make it more explicit. And then last one. If I ask about suicide, I'm going to put words into the person's mind. A lot of times that we, I often get parents or faculties or um, friends coming saying, I'm not sure how to be with her or him or them. Uh, shall I ask that question? I feel like it's getting serious, but I don't know if I it's okay because I don't want to remind him of that. So I want to say here to everyone, there's no evidence showing that asking directly about suicide will increase the risk of suicide. So just want to reassure everyone. And as a matter of fact, we encourage you to ask this question explicitly and directly. Are you thinking about suicide in a compassionate way? If the answer is yes, do not try to convince the people person out of it. Try not to dismiss it. Acknowledge it. Help the person to find the professional help, the support. And sometimes if urgent, call 911. And there's a US National Suicide Prevention Lifeline here. That's 800 number that you can use. So here, I would also like to talk about effective prevention. We mentioned early the importance of effective prevention, right? And I wanna say a little bit here as well. Effective prevention goes beyond the individual. I'm sorry about the spelling here. <laughs> this is a typo here, individual level. So if people can recall, we talk about unique stressors related to our Asian American youth, parenting styles, family communication, cultural identity, stigmatization, discrimination. Those are beyond just the individual level. Those are the influences come from family, come from our local community, come from our national uh, community, international, globally, right? So if we wanna prevent mental health problems from developing, we have to go back to before it starts, when they were children, when they are young adolescents, 
ad uh, young adults. And when they are living in this family context and community. And that's how we can take the water from the left glass out and make it become the water just like in this next glass, next to um, the left one. So why prevention? If people remember, mental disorders top the list of the most costly condition in the US, right? Prevention meaning delay or stop the development of mental health problem. It's the most cost effective approach compared to any other intervention, no matter if it's medication, if it's therapy, if it's uh, different type of schools of uh, psycho treatment, psychotherapy treatment, prevention is the most cost effective one. Not only that, but also more importantly, prevention leads to early detection and early intervention and better improvement. And we talk about early Asian American students who do receive treatment experience less improvement compared to white students. One of the main reasons is low detection or delayed detection. And we talk about how they, those low detection, delayed detection relate to stigmatization and also uh, different or low help in seeking. So when those students come to counseling, they are already struggling with a lot of problems. And a lot of those problems that takes a long time to, um, for them to heal. And meanwhile, the stressors in their life that are contributing to their mental health problems are not changing. And they may not be changed immediately just based on the treatment they received in counseling, which typically is one hour per week, sometimes not even per week. And so prevention is the most effective way to help with early intervention and better improvement before problem gets too, you know, too bad. And then this is a model that we create and talk about what does prevention mean. And there are three goals we want to achieve. The first one is destigmatize mental health problems. So people can feel more comfortable talking and asking for help when they're struggling. Increase mental health awareness and mental health related knowledge and skills. And I have a lot of students struggling with mental health issues, but they don't understand what it is. And then they don't know it's important for them to seek out for treatment. Their family don't know. And there's a tendency to dismiss it or minimize it. And that uh, leads to a delay in treatment. And third goal, provide resources for mental health service. I have a many parents asking me, I, I live in a different state. Where can I get resources for my uh, kid? And I don't know any, um, let's say Chinese speaking or Korean speaking counselor that I can talk to. I don't feel comfortable talking to people who are not from my culture who may not understand my family issue. So we have a lot of families struggling with locating the um, resource, the right resource for them. So for all of those goals we are creating and eventually what we wanna do is to build a community-based effort to prevent and provide resources for mental health problems among Asian American immigrants. And why do I say immigrants? Because in the past the decades, I think um, more than 50% of Asian American families consider themselves as immigrants. Among those people, I think uh, more than 50% of them do not consider their English as their first language. They do not consider themselves speaking English well. So a lot of those Asian American families that are struggling out there in our community come from immigrant families. So I want to give an example of the audience, an example of some of the community-based programs. Uh, one example, especially one example of some uh, community-based programs our Asian American community is uh, offering, is having for our uh, mental health um, improvement. And then this is an uh, organization, nonprofit, grassroots organization. I've been volunteering since 2018. It's called United Chinese Americans. Um, United Chinese Americans. So it's a civil engagement 
organizations that has been very dedicated to youth development, especially youth mental health. And the youth mental health program all started in 2017 when there was a need in the local community. And unfortunately, usually those needs were prompted by tragedy in the community, for example, a death of someone. And when it happened, the community reunited together and we asked for help and support from one another. And mental health professionals, local leaders and volunteers, a lot of them parents, they got up together and talk about the impact of mental health on our youth. It started in Illinois, Chicago, actually, and then Minnesota, and then Wisconsin, and then Vegas, and then other states. And here are some of the photos, and I would like to share with the audience here. So those are the photos of our audience attending some of those events, some of those workshops. And this is one of our parent representative and talking about sharing her personal story. And this is one of our presenter, Polly. And uh, Paul is the uh, co-coordinator of the uh, youth mental health program. And some of you probably know him through his um, uh, foundation, Kevin Lee Foundation, dedicated to Asian American youth identity development. And, um, and every time we went, and then there are there were more than a hundred people there, and um, some parents they would just sit in the aisle or stand behind um, at the back of the uh, the room to listen because it's really crowded. And I remember in Wisconsin, a local uh, organizer told me that they often offer regular workshops for Asian American parents and audience. And our workshop talking about youth mental health was one of the most popular workshop for parents beside the ACT one. <laughs> Um, and there are a lot of things that we offer during those workshops. And we talk about youth culture identity development and talk about effective parent and children communication, evidence-based parenting, anti-bullying, anti-Asian racism, depression and suicide among children and adolescents. And there are different activities we have to deliver those topics, workshops, webinars, story sharing from youth and their parents, dialogue between youth and parents. We also offer support group after the workshops and webinars. So parents, many parents can support, continue to support each other and share resources. And also we have essay contacts and this is for the youth and talk about their identity development and to cultivate a sense of pride uh, sharing their stories, sharing their family stories, sharing their culture stories. And it's very empowering to our youth, especially those who are struggling with their cultural identity. And I wanna say that all, all of those activities and topics we offer and are delivered by our volunteers and volunteers from different fields and with their uh, dedicated time and expertise. And those are some of the other examples and we, uh, topics we have, and they are webinars uh, because of COVID, we are unable to do in-person uh, conference and workshops. So some of those are related to COVID-19 and the bullying, depression in Asian American children, get serious about teen depression, Q and A's. And those two workshops were uh, in response to the local tragedies that happened um, in uh, several places, including a Chicago neighborhood. Uh, I think this was uh, 2020 summer. We lost the two teenagers and also Maryland and uh, Virginia and uh, North Carolina. And we lost a lot of bright young uh, kids because of suicide. And so the community mobilized all the resource together and to offer this resource to parents and help them to go through this hard time. And 
So um, Michelle mentioned the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholar Program. So we are very fortunate to be able to uh, receive this three year funding. Um, uh, last year, uh, last uh, uh, September, we just started. And this funding is dedicated to Asian American uh, immigrant families, especially youth and young adults. And it's a national intervention to increase mental health awareness and de decrease stigma uh, among Asian American fam families. And we have collaborators from different organizations that you can see some, um, some of them are community-based, some of them are affiliated with universities. And what we hope to achieve in the next uh, three years is to develop psych, uh, psychoeducational information for our students, families, and the community, and to organize conversations to promote communications between parents and students to create culturally informed bilingual parenting education program to develop youth and parents leadership council and also hold webinars focusing on community effort in promoting mental health and also we want to create use our social media as um, a place a platform to launch mental health uh, related uh, topics and webinars and also we want to create database that are specifically related to um, providers who are uh, culturally fit for our Asian Americans. Um, those are the things that we hope to start to work on and they may very likely extend beyond the three year project uh, time window. Um, but all of those are going back to the three goals we're trying to aim for, destigmatize mental health problem, increase mental health awareness and literacy, and provide resources for mental health service in order to have a community-based effort to prevent and provide resources for mental health problems among Asian American immigrant families. So, um, that concludes my uh, presentation today and i wanna stop my sharing so i can see uh some of the questions if you have and you can start to um, michelle i believe that people can start to post their questions here okay. and one last thing i'm sorry i uh, just want to say if you have any questions feel free to email me my email at wxie at nd.edu if we don't get to uh, answer your questions today thank you thank you so much uh, for your presentation 